Our next speaker is, uh, is Aditya Mukherjee. He comes from New York and he studied in uh, Columbia and Cornell. In his last five years, four of the five years have been spent in Go. He currently works in, uh, in Stripe in the fraud detection department. And uh, he has a Go JSON, Git Go, Anaconda to his name. He has a dog who weighs as much as him right now. And uh, Finn, his dog, is probably a very, very lucky pet. Uh, interestingly, Aditya has been a national ranked wrestler in the US. That was long before he started coding and then he lost a lot of weight. <laughs> all right, so Aditya, stage all yours. It's great to see so many people uh, here today excited to talk about and, and learn about Go. And I'm excited to be here too because I'm talking about my absolute favorite feature in Go, which is interfaces. When I first started writing Go almost four years ago, I saw interfaces as a limited form of inheritance. So I used interfaces from the standard library when needed, but I would convert them to concrete types as soon as possible, and I almost never saw the reason to write my own. But this changed once I started working on larger projects, like the Twitter client library for Go, which I maintain, uh, and Git Go, which is a pure Go implementation of Git. I began to notice that I got three big wins from using interfaces. Interfaces meant that I could write less code and still get the job done. They meant that I could write more robust code, and my code was more flexible as well. So my goal here today is to distill the lessons that I've learned about interfaces and inspire everyone here to take full advantage of the power that they give. Uh, I apologize for the somewhat dis clashing colors. I was told before that it wouldn't show up if it didn't have a dark background. So hopefully you can see this. Um, these are three basic interfaces. Error needs no explanation. Uh, it's the easily the most widely used interface in Go. And the other two work similarly. Any struct, that pr or actually any type, that provides a method matching one of these exact method signatures will satisfy that corresponding interface. You don't have to declare it ahead of time, so that means that you might actually have written uh, types that satisfy the stringer or the get object interfaces without even realizing it. The IO package from the standard library gives us a number of interfaces for interacting with data, like reading, writing, and closing data sources. They, they define a lot of them. These are only just three of them. So in Go, the os.file type implements all three of these interfaces and more, uh, though some types will implement a, just a subset of these. And we can also combine two or more interfaces. This works exactly as you'd expect. So a read closer is anything that is both a reader and a closer. A read seeker is anything that's both a reader and a seeker. Uh, if you aren't familiar with seek, by the way, it basically allows you to say, jump to, starting at the beginning of this file, jump to the 50th byte, or 50th byte from the end of the file. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a file, it can be any data source which allows arbitrary access. So by combining small, single method interfaces like this, we get precision. So not all readers have to support the close and seek operations. But if we're writing a function that needs to, needs to both read and to seek, we have a way of specifying that without requiring that every function that needs to read also has to, or every type that provides read also has to provide seek and close. And lastly, we also get helper functions. So here are two of them, both from the IOUtil package. Read all will give you a static slice of bytes from, from an arbitrary reader. And no op closer will give you a dummy close method on a reader that doesn't have one. It's really just a hack around the type system to allow you to use uh, a reader where you actually need a read closer even though the reader doesn't actually need to be closed the way a file would. The IO interfaces are some of the most powerful interfaces in the standard library, so it's worth taking a look at what makes them powerful. First, they abstract a lot of common functionality. Input-output is something that pretty much every program needs to do at some point, and under the hood, it can get really complex. So they provide a really convenient, easy-to-use abstraction for this. At the same time, we get a lot of granularity, as we saw. Not every reader has to provide all of the other 
uh, to satisfy all of the other interfaces that also exist in the IO package. We also get a plethora of helper functions. We saw two, and there are many more, not all of them even in the IOUtil package, many other packages that interact with it to make it more convenient to use. Error, though, on the other hand, is interesting because it's powerful, but for almost the exact opposite reasons. Unlike IO, the IO interfaces, it abstracts no functionality whatsoever. The only thing the error interface does for you, that method, it tells you, I am an error and here's the string that corresponds to it. And in fact, in most cases, that string is a statically, uh, statically determined string. It's not even uh, dynamically computed from any runtime data. And there's no granularity. There's only one method and only one interface. There are no related interfaces and no other methods that uh, you are required to provide. And there are almost no helper functions. So you get basically errors.new and format.errorref. That's, that's it. Everything else y you make yourself. And yet error is, the mo is both the most ubiquitous and, and arguably the most powerful interface in the entire language. For the sake of completeness, we should also think about what makes these interfaces less powerful than we would like. The big one, uh, from my point of view, it with, IR, uh, with the I.O. Uh, interfaces is lifecycle management. So here's an example um, that we actually ran into at work. It's a simplified example, but um, it came up in production. Uh, basically, this code will compile and run. It's opening a file and returning, uh, and returning that file as a reader. But if you call it and run it more than, say, 1,024 times, it's going to fail. And the reason it will fail is you're bumping up against the number of open files that you can have on your operating system at any time. You're not closing the files. And just throwing in a close statement and a defer won't fix it for you because then you're closing the file too early. So even though we have the type system that is here and will check for us that you know the close method exists, in this case, it's not going to catch this error, and neither will your test likely. You're going to run up, if, if you have this issue, you're going to find it uh, in production. So you can fix this by changing the method signature to a read closer, but if for whatever reason you can't change the method signature, uh, which can happen sometimes, you the only other option is just to document the expectation of the function and, and hope that the caller knows that you have to call close on it. And the second issue is the impedance mismatch we get with the exact the exact methods that are acquired. This is the reason that no op closer exists. It's nice, it's there as a convenience, but it would be better if we didn't really need it in the first place. Error is also pretty powerful, but there are, there are some drawbacks as well. Uh, the standard library is pretty good about giving us sentinel error values. Um, this is an example from the IO package, the end of file error. So if I'm doing IO and I, and I, find and I encounter a non-nil error, I can check to see, is the error that I just encountered this known error type? The standard library is pretty good about defining these, but third-party packages are not always so great. And this is where overuse of format.errorref can be quite harmful. It, it's really nice, it's a convenient way to get dynamic information about, um, contextual information about an error in the error string, but it means that it's much harder to, to actually categorize and respond to your errors properly. It's much better to use concrete error types that also give you other methods to access that data instead of sticking that into the error string. And I'll admit, this is probably, this is actually the single thing that I dislike mo most about interfaces in Go. Um, there's a reason that they work this way. Um, it's explained in the Go FAQ if you're, if you're interested, um, but it's outside the scope of this talk. Uh, in short, if you want to be able to check that your error, that your uh, interfaces are nil, uh, make sure that you're including the conc or the sorry the error the interface type in all method signatures and not the concrete type. Um, if you know what the concrete type is going to be, you just have to document it. So this is what os.open will do. It uses error in the return signature, but it says if there's an error, it will be of type path error. So now that we've seen some examples, we can infer two criteria for making powerful interfaces. First, our interfaces should be humble. They should specify the weakest possible assumptions that need to be made about our code. For example, if my code, if my function uses an os.file, it's expecting a file, but the only thing it ever does on that file is call the read method on it, 
I don't actually need to require an OS.file as input. By giving an I.O. reader, instead I can I make it more flexible, which means that I can substitute in you know, mock, mock data when, when debugging. But I'm also signaling to anybody who uses the function that the only important thing this function does is read. When I pass in something to this function, I can be pretty confident without looking at the source that it's not going to say, call the chone method on the file, uh, on the file struct, even though that's, that's a valid method that also exists. So it's not just about um, the flexibility there, it's about the ease of use and the convenience. You're specifying the minimal possible contract. Secondly, the interfaces should be disciplined. So whatever contract we require on our data, w the they should all be checkable by the compiler. The error equals equals nil problem is, is the one exception to this, but in general, interfaces that are there so that we can help the compiler help us validate the assumptions that we're making about our code. Now that we know what makes a powerful interface when we see it, the question remains, when should we actually use an interface instead of a struct? And it's actually easier to answer this question in reverse. What are the reasons that we might not want to use interfaces? So from my own experiences with GitGo and the Twitter client library, as well as talking to other gophers, these are the five basic reasons why people generally choose structs over interfaces in their code. Um, I'll get to the other three later, but I want to focus on the first two. They're really just fears of writing interfaces badly, or writing incorrect interfaces. People see structs as the default choice, so if they don't know how to write the right interface for their code, they just reach for a struct instead. Once we learn the principles for writing interfaces well, we should be much less afraid of, of using interfaces as first-class citizens in our code. Uh, so with apologies to Dr. Strangelove, uh, one of my favorite movies, uh, I won't address all of those points, but I would like to share the story of how, when writing Gitgo, I stopped seeing structs as the default choice for, for, writing, uh, for writing Go types. When reading a repository, Gitgo doesn't actually need to know the name of the current working directory. It just needs to be able to read and, read and write files uh, within that directory. So initially, we were using a string to represent the directory instead of the using the file system interface from the standard library because using an interface felt like overkill. And we thought, well, we don't know what methods we'll actually require on this interface, so we can't use one yet. But when you think about it, we already were performing lots of actions based on that string input. We just weren't specifying the assumptions that those actions implied explicitly so we didn't realize it, that we were imposing unnecessary restrictions on our input. I, specifically, because of the way that we were interfacing with the data, or interacting with the data, we required our repositories to be local. And replacing the input with an interface instead of the concrete type, and uh, namely with an interface that actually specified the real, correct, minimal contract for the type, allowed us to uh, remove this assumption and use remote repositories over a network without downloading the whole thing first. This is something actually Git itself doesn't, doesn't really do, um, at least not easily. More broadly, all software is written to solve a problem. When we use structs, we implicitly weave assumptions about the problem statement into our code. And some of those, pro some of those assumptions will be right, but some of them will be wrong. And even the ones that are right might actually be unnecessary. Using interfaces frees us from incorrect or unnecessary assumptions. Now that we know why interfaces are powerful and why we want to use them, the question is, well, how should we design our interfaces? We've seen some examples, but do we want our interfaces to be more like the I.O. interfaces or more like the error interfaces? Because they're very both very powerful, but for different reasons. And the answer is, it, it depends. There aren't really any absolutes. Most good interfaces will actually have a mixture of characteristics from, from both of those examples. You might want to ask yourself a few questions, though, as you start designing your type to think about where you want to draw from I I the I.O. interfaces or where you w would want to draw more from the error interfaces. Is my interface declarative? Is it declaring its identity the way the error interface is, or is it functional? 
When I say functional, I'm not referring to you know, monadic state purity. I, I, was, I was a Lisp programmer before I came to Go. Um, but I just mean, does it actually do something the way the I.O. interfaces do? Uh, the I.O. interfaces, they have state. They have side effect. They're performing a lot of complex transformations of data. Do my interfaces do, do any of those things, or are they more declarative, saying, this is my identity, and here's some probably read-only data that contextualizes uh, an aspect of my identity? Additionally, you want to think, will this interface need any closely related sibling interfaces or cousin interfaces, the way the I.O. interface does, uh, the I.O. interfaces do? Or is it more like the error interface, which is pretty standalone and does its own thing and does it well? We won't go into these two in too much more detail, especially since it might be actually hard to see, but I'll encourage you to look at them more in particular, the handler interface and the file info interface. Handler in particular is, it's a work of art. I think that might be my favorite interface in the entire standard library. And each of these interfaces draws both from the I.O. interfaces as well as from the error interface. Uh, and it's worthwhile taking a look at them and seeing how, how exactly they do that and why they're powerful because they mix those characteristics together. Whether we're modeling our interfaces more after the I.O. interfaces or after error, there are some tricks that we can keep in mind to help write them effectively. If you're designing interface families the way, you, the way that I.O. does, you don't want to write helper methods until you're absolutely sure that you need them. And the standard library is a pretty good uh, example of this. If you actually look through the source control history, you'll see that many of the helper functions associated with the I.O. interfaces were not written at the same time as those interfaces were originally defined. They were written much later. And the reason for this is simple. You don't want to clutter your package with too many extraneous, uh, too, too many things for people to understand when they're first beginning to use it. You want it to be simple. Wait until you actually start to get a little bit annoyed by the absence of certain functions before you start adding them as helper functions. Secondly, the contracts that you provide for each individual interface should be as minimal as possible. That doesn't mean it needs to be a single method interface, but if you find yourself adding too many methods to each interface, you might want to think about splitting them up into composite interface types instead. Uh, because the alternative to that is over-specifying your interface, and in the end, implementations might implement only five out of those ten methods, and the other five they'll just stub out with dummy methods that do nothing. And if you think about interfaces as a contract, that's really just breaking the contract and subverting it. Um, you don't want to do that as much as possible. If you're writing interfaces, though, that are more like the error interface, you want to do exactly one of these two things. Exactly one of these will be applicable in any given situation. Um, it's, you, it's rarely the case that, that both will be. You'll want to provide sentinel, uh, canonical sentinel values if that's relevant. So, for example, um, we saw the sentinel io, um, io.eof error that people can check the value against. <coughs> or you might want to provide a default implementation of your interface. Uh, a good example of this is actually, again, from the, uh, from the I.O. family. We have the I.O. interfaces, but we also have in the bytes package an easy way to take a byte slice or a string and convert that into an I.O. reader or an I.O. writer. Interfaces are powerful because they're very flexible and they're extensible, and people can write their own implementations of them and to specify their exact needs. But you also want people to be able to get up uh, up and off the ground running very quickly. So if you allow them to use default types or the types that they're already used to working with, that will help them get started. We also have a few uh, more advanced techniques for fine-tuning interfaces. Uh, these will not always be applicable in any given situation, but they might help address some of the other three issues that we saw earlier, why people sometimes avoid interfaces. I would argue incorrectly or unnecessarily avoid them. If you want to prevent others from implementing an interface that you define, all you have to do is specify an unexported method. This is something that is uh, sort of a little known secret. It's, it's right there, it's in the spec, you can, you can find it out, but a lot of people don't think about it. Um, it's so it's very easy to enforce that an interface can only be satisfied by types in that same package and prevent others from extending it. 
You can also pair exported structs with an interface type that's used in all function signatures. Even if you don't know how other people will want to extend your type, there's a good chance that they, that they will. And by, given, by using the interface type as the, uh, by using the interface type as the input in, in your functions instead of the concrete type, you allow that flexibility. You essentially allow your package to be compatible with implementations that you never even predicted in the first place. And finally, you can use unexported structs to implement your interfaces. This is uh, something that the standard library does all the time. Um, only a easy example off the top of my mind is um, cancel timer body, which unless you've actually looked at the uh, code for HTTP get in, in net slash HTTP, you probably don't know or you probably wouldn't have seen because you're not really supposed to interact with it. Unless you're actually doing work within the HTTP package itself, you don't need to know about the specific implementations of the IO reader interface that it uses, but they, those are still useful locally. In that vein, I'd actually like to leave you all with a thought experiment. What if Go as a language didn't let us export structs at all? What if the only types that we could import were interfaces? How would that change the way that we write Go code? I wouldn't necessarily recommend this as a, as a way to write Go. It's, it, it doesn't lead itself to, it, it would certainly be really inconvenient in the extreme, but for those of you interested in dipping your toes into the water with interfaces, it's a great exercise for understanding what it really means to treat interfaces as truly first-class citizens in Go and, and seeing what power that gives us. The more that we treat interfaces as first-class citizens in Go, the more that we can reuse our existing code. The more that we treat interfaces as first-class citizens in Go, the more we can validate the contracts that our code makes, even if, we, even if we don't realize it. The more that we treat interfaces as first-class citizens in Go, the more we can free our code of those extraneous or incorrect assumptions. So this right here is the hidden power of interfaces. They're a humble feature, but they're insanely powerful. Thank you. All right, a few announcements before we get into the next talk. One is uh, you have a stall here for Pearson Books. Uh, the new book that is there, The Definitive Guide to Programming with Go, they're giving it a 20% discount. So the book is actually for, uh, it's selling for 600 rupees minus 20% 20, 20 discount. <laughs> and along with that, you get some 10% uh, coupon for Amazon too. Uh, there's a board in that corner for lightning talks. Lightning talks are going to be held this evening, and it's going to be on a first come, first serve basis. So if you write your name from the top, we're going to call you that. Everyone's going to get, this is your chance to get five minutes in the limelight, an excellent opportunity for all people who are sitting in the crowd saying, hey, I wish I could speak too. And this is the stage you're going to speak on, so why not do that? So I'd love to see that board get filled up. And uh, I know we are no Wi-Fi, but that doesn't mean we are on no Twitter conference. So our hashtag is uh, GoForCon India. All one word, hash GoForCon India, no spaces. All right, so 